All right, so microbiology, we're going to talk about the viruses today. So let's start with the hantavirus or the Sinombre. It belongs to the Bernaviridae family, which is a single-stranded negative RNA segmented enveloped helical ca nucleocapsid virus. Now its reservoir, I want you to know, is the deer mouse. The deer mouse. That's the primary reservoir in the United States. So the virus is shed in the feces and the urine. Therefore, it gets transmitted through aerosol or rodent contact with humans, and that's how that that's how that happens. Um, so signs and symptoms. You're going to see flu-like symptoms and respiratory failure. Respiratory failure. Core pulmonal respiratory failure. You're also going to see pulmonary edema with a high high mortality rate. So the hantavirus is a um, robovirus, I like to call it, a rodent-borne virus, unlike the other uh, Bunia viridae, which are arboviruses or arthropod-borne viruses. So you can have um, hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is when you get endothelial injury that leads to edema. It leads to edema, which is concentrated in the lungs. Edema in the lungs. So you, that leads to respiratory failure. The degree of capillary leak can be severe enough to cause uh, pre-renal azotemia. Now remember, anytime we're talking about pre-renal, we're talking about a volume problem to the kidneys. So that's going to that and hypovolemic shock, which will make perfect sense. Now the combination of respiratory or hypoxia um, and uh, renal failure or metabolic uh, abnormalities and failure compounds the injury to cause that is caused by hypovolemic shock. So what do we do? How do we treat this? Well. We can intubate them. We can give them blood pressure support. Basically, it's just supportive care. Supportive care is how you treat uh, the hantavirus. Now, what about the adenovirus? The adenovirus is an icosahedral capsid. It's non-enveloped, and it's a linear double-stranded DNA virus. Its transmission is most commonly through fecal oral, but it can also be through aerosols. Um, uh, group infections occur in crowded conditions like military barracks, college dorms, etc. Um, infections or it infects the mucosal respir respiratory epithelium, causing upper respiratory disease. It infects the mucosal respiratory epithelium, causing upper respiratory disease. So you get pharyngitis. Atypical pneumonia, atypical pneumonia, and non perianent viral conjunctivitis. All right, now the most common virus isolated from young children with a febrile illness is the adenovirus. It is the most common cause of tonsillitis in young children. Tonsillitis in young children and it is the most common cause of viral conjunctivitis. Now, the second most common cause of conjunctivitis overall is H. influenza. So what are the top five causes of the common cold, besides adenovirus being one of them? Can you name a few? Well, the rhinovirus, absolutely, that's the first one that comes to mind. The coronavirus, the influenza C virus, and the Coxsackie virus. Those are your top five causes of the common cold. Now, you need to know that, um, so I'm going to write that in there for you. The rhinovirus... Coronavirus, adenovirus, 
influenza C. And Coxsackie. All right, and now the adenovirus can also cause non-bloody diarrhea, so non-dysenteric diarrhea in children under two years old, and it can also cause hemorrhagic cystitis in young males. So hemorrhagic cystitis can be a, a pretty big problem. So, um, and like we said, it's the most common cause of viral conjunctivitis, um, and it's the most common cause of tonsillitis in young children. So very good. All right, the arboviruses. These are the fun ones. Okay, so these are arthropod-borne viruses. Now, all the viruses listed here have mosquito vectors. Mosquito is the vector. Mosquito vectors. These include some flaviviruses, some totoviruses, and some varinaviruses. Um... The flava and the totovirus are both single-stranded positive RNA non-segmented enveloped icosahedral nucleocapsids, where the Bunya virus is a single-stranded negative RNA. It's segmented, unlike the flava and the tovirus, and it's enveloped. The both all three are enveloped, and it's got a helical nucleocapsid. Um, an example of the tick-borne virus or the Colorado tick fever virus or a Rio virus. Now, the big picture here, the big, big picture is all cause encephalitis, which is acute inflammation of the, of the brain and, and fever. Now, the, the Flaviviridae viruses is the dengue, virus, uh, dengue fever virus, the yellow fever virus, the Japanese encephalitis virus, the St. Louis encephalitis virus, the West Nile virus, um, HCV is a flavonovirus, but is not arthropod born. Now, the toga viridae are alpha viruses. They, they cause equine encephalomyelitis. They also cause the Western equine encephalomyelitis and the Eastern equine encephalomyelitis. And they also cause the Venezuelan or the VEE. The, these three viruses all infect birds, horses, and humans, and they use what as a vector? The mosquito. It infects the reticuloendothelial cells, which causes a lysis, which causes a viremia, which leads to the CNS, which leads to encephalitis, which leads to headache, which leads to meningitis. Um, now, the Bunyirdae, or the Bunyaviridae, family is the California encephalitis, the sand fly fever, and the Rift Valley fever. So, the St. Louis encephalitis is a flavivirus, and is, that is in the southeastern United States. Southeastern United States, Canada, Caribbean, In South America. It causes, it's a cause of epidemic viral encephalitis in the U.S. HSV is the number one cause in adults and HSV2 in neonates. So HSV-1 is the most common cause in adults of uh, epidemic viral encephalitis. Now, the St. Louis encephalitis, or it's also a common cause of ar arboviral encephalitis along with West Nile encephalitis. So let's talk about Japanese encephalitis, which is also a flavivirus. Now, it's prevalent in Southeast Asia. Japanese, as you might expect, Southeast Asia. Um, so moving right along, let's talk about the West Nile virus. I don't think there's much more to say about the Japanese encephalitis. A lot, there's a lot of overlap with all these. 
Now, this is the most commonly diagnosed arbovirus in the U.S., so you're going to be tested on this one, the West Nile virus. The West Nile virus is the most widely dispersed disease of all arboviruses. It is global. The first outbreak in the U.S. was in New York City, and now it's spread all across the United States. Um, what acts as the major amplifying host? There's two things, but there's one that's more important than the other. For the West Nile virus, it's birds. Birds. Also, you might not think of this, also horses. Horses also act as the amplifying host. Now, the signs and symptoms include CNS infection or infective symptoms such as encephalitis, men men meningi or meningitis, as well as fever, headache, somnolence, and in some cases, muscle weakness can be seen. So it's going to be similar to what? West Nile virus is going to present similar to Guillain-Barre syndrome. So the prevention is a DEET containing sprays. Now the most important risk factor for severe disease is age. So it's worse for the elderly. Now let's talk about the yellow fever virus. This is in tropical Africa and South America. Tropical Africa and South America. It's transmitted by the Aedes mosquito. The Aedes mosquito. Now you have a the signs and symptoms of the yellow fever are going to be a little different. So let's write these in there. You're going to see a sudden onset of jaundice, so it can cause hepatitis. Uh, you're going to see a fever or a high fever. So it can cause jaundice. And hepatitis. High fever. Myalgias. And organ involvement, which is going to lead to shock. Which is going to lead to upper GI hemorrhage, known as hematemesis. So the hemorrhage in the GI tract, you're going to see black vomit. That's a clue for you. You see somebody with black vomit, start thinking some uh, yellow fever on your differential. Now, there's a live attenuated vaccine that's available. Um, on H&E stain of the liver, it's going to show something called councilman bodies. Councilman bodies. So these are eosinophilic, acidophilic inclusions are a sign that the hepatocyte is undergoing apoptotic death, which are mostly due to infection by yellow fever virus, but they can be also present in viral hepatitis. So councilman bodies. That's what you see when you do a liver biopsy for yellow fever because it's causing the hepatitis. So let's talk about dengue fever. We already talked about yellow fever, so let's talk about dengue fever. Dengue fever is the most common arbovirus worldwide. Most common arbovirus worldwide is dengue fever. You see this guy on the Gulf Coast? U.S., the Caribbean, and tropical areas worldwide. So I think that right there is your key word, tropical areas, start thinking dengue fever. Now in the tropics, you see a uh, the dengue fever, which is a break bone fever disease, okay? And then Southeast Asia, you see a dengue hemorrhagic fever. Now, the classic dengue fever signs and symptoms is a acute febrile illness with muscle, with severe muscle, joint, and back pain, hence break bone fever. All right, that's the dengue fever. You also see a macular papular rash, severe headaches, and retroorbital pain.
Now the worst form, the dengue hemorrhagic fever, which was from where? That's right, Southeast Asia, is involving GI hemorrhage. So that's going to lead to what? Shock. Now that is more common in Southeast Asia. So now we're going to talk about the Togo virus that is extremely deadly, and that is the East Equine Encephalitis virus, or the Togo virus. It's the most severe diseases of the encephalitides. The more E's are in the name, the worse it is. So the EEE, -E -E, um, you find this in the Atlanta and the Gulf Coast of Mexico states. usually see about zero to four cases per year. And you see about zero to four cases per year. And then that takes us into the Venezuelan equine encephalitis togovirus. He is also a togovirus, but there's not that much really that you're going to be tested on by him. Now, the Western equine encephalitis is also a togovirus. Now, it's west of the Mississippi in U.S. and Canada. Okay, and then we have California encephalitis, which is a, bun a bunya virus. Now, it's spread by the Zaydes tick, or Zaydes mosquito. Zaydes mosquito. He is a reservoir of, or a reservoir or small mammals in North America. Now, it's more common in school-aged children, unlike the West Nile or St. Louis encephalitis. So the California encephalitis, which is of the Bernier uh, virus family, is more, more common in school-aged children. It can cause seizures and neurological disorders, but is non-fatal. So you might be tested on the difference of California encephalitis. If I was going to look at two, I would look at dengue fever. I would definitely look at Eastern equine encephalitis, California encephalitis, and if this thing will cooperate with me and go back, I would look at the West Nile virus. But the big picture, like I said, all cause encephalitis and fever. Okay? And these are mosquitoes. They use mosquitoes or vectors. These are arboviruses. All right, let's talk about the calciviruses, which is the Norwalk and the norovirus. All right, so this is a positive strand, single-stranded RNA, naked icosahedral fecal oral transmission virus. It is one of the most common causes of viral gastroenteritis worldwide. Okay, one of the most common causes of viral gastroenteritis worldwide. You have a self-limiting, non-bloody, so non-dysentery diarrhea. You'll see nausea and vomiting. Um, you also see outbreaks. This is a big clue for you on cruise ships and with shellfish. But cruise ships is the one that I've seen tested over and over and over. So how do you diagnose this? You do RT-PCR and an ELISA, and that's basically the Norwalk and the uh, norovirus that you want to be tested on. Just know it's an RNA virus, um, fecal oral transmission, one of the most common causes. A viral gastroenteritis worldwide, and it's usually done uh, through cruise ships. So enteroviruses. So this goes for all enterovirus or the picornoviruses. They are icosahedral capsid, non-enveloped, linear. They have a positive sense, single-stranded RNA, um, and they're a picornovirus with a fecal-oral transmission. Fecal-oral transmission. It includes the poliovirus. Poliovirus, Coxsackie virus, Echovirus, and 
hepatitis A. Hepatitis A virus. So, enteroviruses are the number one cause of aseptic number one cause of aseptic meningitis. Number one cause of aseptic meningitis. They replicate in the intestinal tract and may progress to a viremia. Now, so let's talk about the polio virus. This is a SOC or killed Sabin live attenuated vaccine. Now, this is the only form used in the U.S. because there is no risk for developing the actual disease. The disadvantage is that it only induces formation of IgG. Um, so the live attenuated vaccine is better at inducing an IgA because remember, these replicate where? In the intestinal tract. So the live attenuated vaccine is better at inducing an IgA or local intestinal immunity in addition to IgG. So it's taken orally. The virus is shed in the feces, providing group immunity when person-to-person -person contact happens. This vaccine is recommended for use in developing countries by the HWO. Now note, the risk of vaccine-associated paralytic poliomyelitis due to revert mutants is rare, but can be problematic for who? Immunocompromised people, okay? Now, it's eradicated in the Western Hemisphere, but there's still some cases in India and Pakistan of the polio virus. Now, um, it replicates in the Peyer's patches, which causes a viremia, which causes it crosses the blood-brain barrier, which gets into the CNS and causes aseptic meningitis or non-paralytic poliomyelitis or paralytic poliomyelitis. So it's, what it's doing is it's, destruction, it's having destruction of the motor neurons in the anterior horn. So you're getting a paralytic disease or a lower motor neuron disease. So you want to have decreased deep tendon reflexes and a respiratory insufficiency is the one that worries you the most. So let's talk about the Coxsackie A and B virus. Now the group A causes herpangina or the same thing as mouth blisters, acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis and hand foot mouse disease. Um, note the top three causes of rashes on the palms and soles. Can you name them? Syphilis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, that's one I always remember, and Coxsackie Virus. So let's talk about the group B. It causes myocarditis, pericarditis, um, Borholm's disease. Let me write that in there. That's the devil's grip or epidemic polydemia. Group B here causes... They probably throw this at you on the board. You never know. Born Holmes disease. They call that the devil's grip or epidemic pleurodynia. And it also causes hepatitis. Now the myocarditis, if severe enough, can result in a dilated, restrictive, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I've seen questions on this. Dilated cardiomyopathy. So the Coxsackie group B um, can cause myocarditis, which can lead to a dilated cardiomyopathy. So therefore, you're going to hear an S3 or an S4. You're going to hear an S3. Very good. It's a dilated cardiomyopathy. Both groups cause aseptic meningitis and the common cold. Aseptic meningitis and the common cold. Very good. So what about the echinoviruses? Well, this is inter inter cytopathic human orphan virus. This uh, causes aseptic meningitis, URIs, and hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. Um, so what about the HAV? This is a fecal oral cause of acute viral hepatitis. Fecal oral of acute viral hepatitis. Now there's no chronic infection. No chronic infection. It's mostly asymptomatic. And 
most in um, its diagnosis is through IgM antibody. It's an inactivated killed virus available as a vaccine. It can treat close contacts with gamma, gamma globulin, which is antibodies from normal populations. So that's how you can prophylax uh, against the enteroviruses. So let's talk about Ebola or the fib fibrovirus, fibrovirus. So it's a single-stranded negative RNA enveloped virus, as are all negative RNA viruses, and they're non-segment. This one is non-segmented. It includes Ebola and the Marburg viruses and acute hemorrhagic fever with high mortality rate is what it causes. Acute hemorrhagic fever. So what's the treatment for this? Supportive only. Supportive treatment only. That's for the Ebola viruses. So HIV and the retrovirus. Now, I could talk about this one for two hours, but I'm going to keep it short and sweet for you and just what you need to know. So it's got an icosahedron capsule. It's enveloped. It's diploid. It's got a positive sense single-stranded RNA um, lentivirus, and it's a slow-type rheovirus. The two strands are identical. The two strands are identical. So the envelope consists of a lipid bilayer. Um, it has GP4041 and GP120 glycoproteins. GP41, GP120 glycoproteins. Now the GP120 is a major surface antigen that interacts with the CD4 receptor. The CD4 receptor. So the GP41 fuses the viral envelope with the target cell membrane. Fuses with the target cell membrane. All right, so now the P24 is the group specific antigen located. Does anybody know where P24 is located? It's located in the core. It's located in the core. Now, antibodies to P24 are an early serologic marker of infection. So how is HIV transmitted? It's transmitted through blood and semen, usually sexual activity, IV drug abuse, blood transfusions. It can also be um, vertical transmission, so mother to infant. Now, you have a viral transcriptase or a viral reverse transcriptase which takes viral RNA and converts it to double stranded DNA. And it's inserted into the host cell genome by this guy, integrase. Integrase. He is another viral enzyme. So following insertion of the double stranded DNA, because why? This guy has a positive stranded sense single RNA lentivirus, okay? Following insertion of proviral DNA into the host genome, the host cell transcription and translation machinery can be exploited to generate viral polyproteins, such as gag, pole, envelope, etc. So HIV infects CD4, CD4 T lymphocytes, um, specifically CD4 and CXCR4, which is a alpha chemokin receptor. And it also infects macrophages. And that is CD4. And CCR5, which is a beta chemokine receptor 5. Now, if you have a CCR5 mutation, if you have a CCR5 mutation and you have a homozygous mutation, you have immunity to the HIV virus. But if you have a heterozygous uh, mutation, you just get a slower course of the disease. So, 
the diagnosis, the first test is the ELISA test. ELISA, we're looking for the antibody that confirms positives with the Western blot. That's how you confirm a positive test on the ELISA. Now, viral loads can be determined by the RT PCR, um, which monitors efficacy of drug therapy. So the criteria for AIDS is a CD4 count under 200, a CD4 count under 200, under 200, or confirmed HIV positivity with AIDS-defining opportunistic infections such as pneumocystis cornea pneumonia, candida esophagitis, etc. All the opportunistic infections, and then we have something called heart. Heart therapy. It's a combination of three to four drugs of classes of the NRTI, which is the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, the non nucleoside reverse tra transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors. Integrase inhibitors, and entry fusion inhibitors. All right, and that's pretty much HIV and all you're going to be tested on and all you need to know about it. Um, don't forget that integrase right there. That's quite commonly overlooked. So let's talk about hepatitis B and the hepadeno, hepadenovirus. So he is an icosahedral capsule enveloped with circular, partially double-stranded DNA. Now DNA polymerase has both RNA-dependent, which is our uh, reverse transcriptase, and DNA-dependent activity. So replication occurs in three steps. Number one, the virus enters the cell. Number two, in the nucleus, the host RNA polymerase. The host RNA polymerase transcribes a full length RNA transcript, which then is an RNA intermediate unique for DNA viruses. And number three, RNA intermediate returns to the cytoplasm. When it returns to the cytoplasm, viral DNA polymerases reverse transcribe from this RNA intermediate to make progeny DNA. Now, only retroviruses and hepatitis B can reverse transcript have reverse transcriptase ability. So it's not just HIV; it's also hepatitis B or hepadeno, uh, hepadenoviruses like Hep B. Now, the only two DNA viruses with at least part of their replication cycle occurring within the cytoplasm, can you name them? The pox virus and HPV. So what are my serologic markers? Well, you have the surface antigen, which is right here. Now, this indicates an active infection or carrier state. Remember that is the surface antigen. Now you have the protective antibody against the surface antigen and it indicates immunity to HPV. And then you have the antibody against the core antigen. Now this is critical for diagnosis during the window phase. Um, when the H HBS antigen is absent, but the HBS antibody isn't detectable yet, um, note that the 
hepatitis B core antibody does not provide immunity or protection like the HSB surface antibody. So that's why it's critical um, for diagnosis during the window period. You want to see that core antigen. So what about another core antigen? That's the, that's the HBE. <clears throat> that is the HBE. That is another core antigen, and its presence indicates transmissibility. Indicates transmissibility. And then the hepatitis core antigen antibody is another antibody against the core or HBE antigen and it indicates a low transmissibility. It indicates a low transmissibility and remember this right here was nothing more than the core antigen or the core that should be there this is the core antigen All right, so the vaccine, or actually let's talk about the diagnostic test. It depends on the time since the infection. Um, chronic carriers will always have, always have a positive hepatitis B surface antigen, always. That's a chronic carrier, and they will have a negative, a negative HBS antibody serology. These are chronic carriers, but will have anti hepatitis uh, core antibodies. Now, chronic infection is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. Chronic infection is more likely when inoculation occurs early, probably is inversely proportional with age or other infections starting at birth versus acute infections is more likely in adults. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the, the vaccine. It's a recombinant hepatitis B surface antigen. We use bacteria as a recombinant form to, to get that. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of acute hepatitis B infections, you're going to get jaundice, dark urine, GI disturbances, serum sickness-like syndrome due to a large number of hepatitis surface antigens and antibody complexes. Um, that's huge right there, so serum-like sickness due to complexes of each one of those. Uh, you're going to get a fever, skin rashes, arthralgia, and arthritis, which normally go away with the jaundice. Now, the host sailor immune response is thought to play a role in the pathogenesis of liver damage. So let's talk about the chronic uh, signs and symptoms. Well, that's simple. You're going to see cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Remember, I told you it was a link. It was linked with hepatocellular carcinoma. So some extra hepatic findings. It's got a strong association with polyarthritis nodosa and glomerular nephritis due to the immune complex deposition. Okay. Note that more than half of patients do not have a history of acute infection. This is mostly due to the perinatal infection. Okay, so that is hepatitis B for you in a nutshell. So let's talk about hepatitis. Well, there's four main viruses that cause, he that cause hepatitis, and that's hepatitis A, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, and E, because we've already talked about V. That's the only one that's a DNA, so these are all RNA viruses. Um, and the one DNA virus, like we said, was hepatitis B. So HAV, hepatitis A virus, is a, H, is a RNA picornovirus, and it's transmitted fecal orally, and it causes acute hepatitis. There is no chronic carrier state for hepatitis A. Now, hepatitis C is a flavivirus, not a picornovirus like hepatitis A. It's transmitted by blood. It's transmitted by blood. 
and it causes acute hepatitis. Um, and there is a chronic carrier state. with hepatitis C. Um, and it's usually 60 to 80%. You see cirrhosis and possible hepatocellular carcinoma with hepatitis C, just like you see with uh, HBV. Now the Delta virus, which is the uh, hepatitis D virus, is transmitted by, what do you think it's transmitted by? Again, D is transmitted by blood. Um, so that now we got two transmitted by blood. Um, and we also we're going to talk about two that are transmitted fecal orally. Um, so the one, uh, Delta virus, it needs the HBV for co-infection or you could think of it as super infection. It's a defective RNA virus and it requires the hepatitis B surface antigen um, for replication. So it's a defective RNA virus, the Delta virus there. Now, the enteric or the hepatitis E virus is transmitted fecal orally or also it is waterborne. So it causes acute hepatitis and it is more virulent during a certain time in a person's life. Hepatitis E, I want you to think pregnancy. Acute hepatitis in pregnancy Think right away to hepatitis E. Now, like we said, there's only one DNA virus that causes hepatitis, and that's hepatitis B. Um, it's transmitted by blood. What were the other two transmitted by blood? Hepatitis C and hepatitis D, which makes sense because he requires hepatitis B. Only 10% become chronic carriers with hepatitis B. So there's an increased chance if perinatal infection is involved, so you get cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Now the big picture to remember is oral fecal transmission, bowels hit the bowels, A and E, fecal oral. Blood transmission is chronic carriers, cirrhosis and carcinoma, hepatitis B, C and D, which we've already talked about in depth. And now let's talk about acute versus chronic hepatitis. So acute viral hepatitis there's a variable in incubation period, so you get flu-like symptoms followed by jaundice. You'll have an increased, a highly increased ALT and a highly increased AST, but a more moderately increased GGT and ALFOS, moderately, with acute viral hepatitis. But now with chronic hepatitis, um, no, that when would, let, let's say this, when would you see um, an increased, a really increased GGT and an ALFOS, but only a moderately increased AST and ALT. Think about that. When you have some type of obstruction. All you got to do is look at this guy. ALFOS. If he is elevated, there's some type of obstruction. Because the only two places you find alkaline phosphatase is in the common bile duct and in the bone. So, there you go. That's a nice little tip for you on the exam. Chronic viral hepatitis. This is the active disease that persists for more than six months without recovery or an asymptomatic carrier which carries the virus and does not develop injury due to lack of anti-surface antibody production. So, asymptomatic carriers may have slightly elevated AST and ALT and possible hepatomegaly. So, moving right along, hepatitis C virus. He is an icosahedral capsid, envelope, linear, positive sense, single-stranded flavivirus. Now, the, what were the other flavoviruses? They included dengue fever, yellow fever, hepatitis C, St. Louis encephalitis, and West Nile virus, okay? Now the transmission is by blood, so a vast majority of infections occur from IV drug abusers or sexual contact with hepatitis C. The histology is a patient with chronic hepatitis C have lymphocytic infiltrates, which makes sense because this is a virus contained within the portal tract or expanding out of the portal tract into liver, liver lobules. Now, 60 to 80 percent of patients with a chronic, with an active infection, develop chronic hepatitis C. 
an estimated 20% and perhaps as many as 50% of patients with chronic disease develop cirrhosis, and that usually takes 10 to 20 years. Ten to twenty years to develop cirrhosis. Number one is in, uh, identification. Identi you need to have a liver. <laughs> I can't even say this word. <laughs> um, you need to have uh, identification for liver transplant in the U.S. So hepatitis C virus. Plus, alcoholic cirrhosis leads you to a very high increase for hepatocellular carcinoma. So if you have hepatitis C, you definitely do not want to be drinking with it. So let's talk about CMV. CMV is, how is CMV transmitted? Well, it can be transmitted congenitally, which is transplacental with the birth canal, sexually through semen or cervical secretions, breast milk, saliva, blood transfusion, or oral transplantation. CMV, 90, about 90% of us, 90 to 95% of us have it in our blood at any one time anyway. So what do you think the number one thing that's going to kill you after you have an organ transplant is going to be? It's going to be CMV, right? That's what I'm picking every time. Um, it's a latent infection in white blood cells. It's a latent infection in white blood cells. Now, the pathogenesis of CMV is it infects epithelial cells and salivary glands, which establishes a persistent infection in epithelial cells. Example will be the renal tubular cells and macrophages. And a latent infection in white blood cells. And that's why we just said that. It establishes a latent infection in white blood cells. So you get a reactivation during when? Organ transplantation, or another way of saying that is immunosuppression. I think organ transplantation, or transplantation would be a great way of saying immunocompression or uh, suppression or AIDS. Um, the MHC1 viral peptide complex is unstable in CMV-infected cells. So CMV effectively um, thwarts cytotoxic T-cell-mediated killing by blocking MHC1 expression. It blocks MHC1 expression of viral antigens on the surface of CMV-infected white blood cells. So if a pregnant woman has previously been exposed uh, or infected with CMV, she will produce an anti-CMV IgG, which prevents trans transplacental infection due to future exposure. Now, because remember, IgG is the only antibody that can cross the placenta. Now, primary infection in a pregnant woman um, without antibodies against the virus, CMV crosses the placenta and can infect the fetus, causing congenital CMV. So if she doesn't have the anti-CMV IgG, that can happen. 90% have no clinical evidence of disease as newborns. Um, that's why so many of us have this. Now, the signs and symptoms that may be present at birth but resolve within the first few weeks of life may be a thrombocytopenic purpura, which they call the blueberry muffin. The blueberry muffin rash. That's CMV. It's similar to the rash of congenital rubella. You can also see hepatosplenomegaly and jaundice, which would be expected. Um, signs and symptoms that can be permanent and devastating. Microcephaly. Let's actually write these down here on a new one. Microcephaly, mental retardation, deafness, intracranial calcifications. which are periventricular versus the intra, intra 
cranial calcifications distributed throughout the cortex and basal ganglia in congenital, that's right, toxoplasmosis. Very good. And the last thing you'll see is seizures. So that's signs and symptoms that can be permanent and devastating with the CMV infection. Now the epidemiology of, C of congenital CMV is congenital infection in the developmental wor in developed world. It's a viral cause of mental retardation in the United States, and it's a cause of sensi sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, sensory neural hearing loss. Now, immunocompetent patients are asymptomatic or heterophil negative mononucleosis, which is fatigue, fever, abnormal lymphocytes on the peripheral smear. Now, immunosuppressed people, such as, again, organ transplantation, I'm telling you that's how they're going to go at this, and immunocompromised people or an AIDS, which is a CD4 count usually below 75s when you start to see this, are patients that experience a much more severe clinical course, which may include CMV retinitis, CMV retinitis, especially in AIDS patients, which is a progressive blindness, and bilateral retinal hemorrhage and cottonal wool exudates, which are white opaque patches at the retinal periphery. In the GI, you can get CMV esophagitis. That's especially in AIDS patients with a linear ulceration versus a punched out ulceration characteristic of yeah, if you had a punched out lesion versus a linear ulceration, um, you would think of a HSV1 esophagitis. When this is going to give you, um, this linear ulceration is going to give you painful swallowing. So in the lungs, it can cause atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia in the kidney it can cause progressive renal failure. Progressive renal failure, which you're going to see increased BUN, increased creatinine. Um, your analysis demonstrating renal tubular cells with intranuclear inclusions. In the adrenal gland, it can cause Addison's disease. Addison's disease, which is primary adrenal insufficiency. Now, let's go to... Urinalysis. Urinalysis has a culture buffy coat of white blood cells and a PCR or serology. Now, urinalysis shows renal tubular cells with intranuclear inclusions. Intranuclear. Hmm, intranuclear. I wonder if CMV is a DNA or RNA virus. My money's on DNA because it's in the nucleus. So the culture of buffy coat or white blood cells look for large uh, cytomeglo with prominent basophilic intranuclear inclusions surrounded by a clear white halo, and we call those owl's eyes. Al's eyes inclusions, which you can't miss. Um, PCR assay for CMV DNA or RNA in body fluids. You get how do you, so? How do you treat this thing? You treat it with gancyclovir, or an, and if they're gancyclovir resistant, you treat it with phoscarnet. And that is CMV for you. So let's talk about EBV. Okay, so EBV is a herpes virus, icosahedral capsid that surrounds it. He is enveloped and he has a linear double-stranded DNA. Now, his transmission is through saliva, okay, which is why they call him the kissing bug. Saliva, so the, the transmission is through the saliva. The pathogenesis, EBV, first infects epithelial cells in the oropharynx or nasopharynx and salivary tissue 
that disseminates in the blood and infects B cells. So what is a heterophil positive mononucleosis? This is mostly in adolescents um, that where they call, like I said, the kissing disease. This means that the patient's serum will agglutinate, agglutinate um, non-human uh, red blood cells such as sheep's. Contrast to this with the heterophil negative mononucleosis caused by CMV. Very good. So some signs and symptoms include fatigue, fever, pharyngitis, anorexia, generalized tender adenopathy, um, splenomegaly, danger of splenic rupture. So patients should avoid contact sports with EBV exposure. Um, now, EBV infection of the cells of the or oropharynx may predispose people to oral hairy leukokemia, leukoplakia in susceptible patients. This is non-tender um, adherent, which is non-scrapable, white lesions on the tongue or oral mucosa due to hyperproliferation of lingual epithelial cells. It's most commonly seen in AIDS patients. Now, also, EBV is strongly associated with mixed cellularity, um, mixed cellularity subtype of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, this presents as a mediastinal mass um, that is non-tender or, or, yeah, it presents as a mediastinal mass or non-tender lymphinopathy. It's constitutional B symptoms that mimic the presentation of mono, so like swollen lymph nodes, recurrent fevers. So what do you do? You get a mono spot test to rule it out. So if it's a malignant cell, you're going to see reed sternberg cells, B cell origin cells, which are CD15, CD30 positive, uh, binucleate with prominent nuclei, which are your owl's eyes. So the mixed cellularity, 25% of them has mostly reed sternberg cells. Now, EBV is associated with Burkitt's lymphoma, also known as small, non cleaves and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The African form commonly presents as a mass on the maxilla or mandible, where the American form more commonly presents as what? An abdominal mass. So, lymphoid tissues will have a starry sky appearance. Starry sky appearance. Um, the dark sky is the sheets of high-grade lymphocytes, whereas the stars are the macrophages eating apoptotic high-grade tumor cells. So most translocations are 814 with Burkitt's lymphoma, where CMIG proto-oncogene ends up next to a highly expressed IgG heavy chain, so you get CMIG overexpression. Guess what you get in the, most, the next most common translocation, which is a 28. Um, you get CMIG over overexpression, so just pick that on the exam. Um, and how do you diagnose this? With a heterophil antibody test or EBV specific antibody test. That is how you diagnose EBV. So moving right along. HHV or human, human herpes virus or the herpes vir day are HHV6 and HHV8. So HHV6, this is exanthium subitum, or sixth disease, or also known as roseola. Um, it's primarily seen in infants 6 to 24 months of age. So what do you see? You see a high-grade fever for three to four days. Then you see a lacy body rash that spares the face, spares the face, and appears after the fever has resolved. This is HHV6. Six or six disease, roseola. Compare this with fifth disease, erythema infectiosum, which is caused by which virus? Parvovirus B19, very good. Um, you see a low grade fever for seven to 10 days. So you get a classic erythematous macule rash that starts on the face. That's why they call it slap cheeks that appears after resolution of the fever. So two days after the slap cheeks first appear, the rash may spread to the extremities where it takes on a lacy reticular pattern. Um, it's the most common cause of infant febrile seizures is HHV6. So what about HHV8? Kroposky sarcoma associated herpes. This is sexually transmitted. Sexually transmitted. HHV8 viral gene induces VEGF. 
which is vascular endothelial growth factor, which leads to a Karposky sarcoma. Now, malignancy of endothelial cells give these dark purple lesions, um, give these dark purple lesions on the skin or mucosa, GI tract, and lungs. Okay, it's most commonly seen in AIDS patients. Most commonly seen in AIDS patients, or the most common cancer. Now, the most common location would be the hard palate and the lymphocytic infiltrate in Karposky sarcoma, which would make sense. Why? Versus a neutrophilic infiltrate, maybe in like uh, bacillary angiomatosis caused by Bartonella hensley, um, which it mimics the gross appearance of Karposky sarcoma. So if you see a neutrophilic infiltrate with bacillary angiomatosis, then you know it's Bartonella hensley. But if you see a lymphocytic infiltrate, then you know it's what? HHV8 or Kraposky sarcoma associated herpes virus. Okay? And then you can have um, the nuclear antigen, the HHV encoded protein, which inactivates the RB tumor suppressor protein, which inactivates the RB tumor suppressor protein, which is an RB gene on chromosome 13. So you get uncontrolled cell proliferation, which contributes to malignancy transformation. So HHV8 also infects B cells. B cells, which is primary effusion lymphomas. Primary effusion lymphomas is how you get those. So what about the herpes beer day or the herpes simplex virus? First one is usually through the transmission via respiratory secretions and saliva. Now, HSV1 usually causes infection above the waist. HSV1 above the waist. For example, herpes labiosus, which is oral lesions or cold sores or Conjunctivo con, or keratinoconjunctivitis, which is the most common infection cause of corneal blindness in the United States, or temporal lobe encephalitis. Herpes loves the temporal lobe, so it's the most common cause of sporadic encephalitis in the United States. Uh, although HSV1 infection typically occurs above the waist, such as herpes labiosus or labius, um, HSV1 infection occurs below the waist, and that's where you get genital uh, herpes and sometimes occurs, which possibly is due to oral sex practices, etc. Now, after primary infection, the virus remains latent in sensory ganglia. So this one is below the waist. Below the waist. Now, after primary infection, they lay dormant or latent in sensory ganglia, like trigeminal uh, ganglia, um, which can reactivate in response to some type of stressor. stressor. So from a cranial nerve uh, glioma uh, to cranial nerve glia, ganglia, HSV may also continue on to the brain, which is going to cause what? Temporal lobe encephalitis, herpes, simplex type virus type 1, uh, loves the temporal lobe of the brain. So let's talk about the below the below the belt there, the HSV2. This usually causes infection below the waist, such as, such as herpes genitalia, however possibly due to oral sex practices. HSV2 infection above the waist, like herpes libalysis, is sometimes observed. After primary infection, HSV2 remains latent in sensory ganglia specifically at the lumbosacral ganglia, um, but may reactivate in response to some stressor. So during pregnancy with herpes simplex 1 or herpes simplex 2, it can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. Recall the torch infections. What were they? Toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, Herpes simplex or HIV and syphilis. So herpes simplex is one of your torch infections. It's the H. So all right, so it can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. 
It can also, number two, call, can cause infection of the newborn during delivery. So how do you diagnose it? You diagnose it with a Tanzac smear of a sample of an open vesicle in patients with HSV1, HSV2, or VZV. You look for multinucleated giant cells with intranuclear inclusion bodies. So, how do you treat this thing? You treat it with acyclovir. However, acyclovir will not eradicate HSV1 or HSV2 during latent infections because HSV thymidine kinase and DNA polymerase are not made during latency. So that's how that works. That's herpes virus for you. So let's talk about the VCV, the herpes viridae varicella zoster virus. So the transmission is through respiratory secretions or contact with varicella vesicles. Now VZV infection may cause number one, chicken pox, which is varicella, or shingles, which is the herpes zoster virus. It can also cause encephalitis and pneumonia. Now note, VZV pneumonia is severe and often fatal, but usually occurs in immunocompromised patients. So what is the pathogenesis of the VZV infections? Well, it replicates in the respiratory tract. It replicates in the respiratory tract. So that can lead to a two-week incubation period, which leads to a viremia, which leads to an asynchronous vesicular rash. Asynchronous vesicular rash, which establishes a lifelong latent infection in sensory ganglia. Okay, lifelong, life, partner for life, late infection in sensory ganglia. Okay, so that would be like dorsal root ganglia. So what about the clinical course of uh, VZB? Well, it's a mild fever with a prodrome, which is like a headache, anorexia, abdominal pain for 24 to 48 hours before onset of generalized vesicular asynchronous rash asynchronous generalized vascular asynchronous rash the rash lesions are asynchronous or ie are out of uh, different shapes or stages versus the synchronous rash lesions of smallpox which are all in the same stage of development or evolution now the rash consists of macules and papules with central vesicles which are dew drops on a rose petal they become pustules and scabbed over crust um, maternal VZV infection during the 20, during the first 20 weeks of pregnancy leads to congenital varicella syndrome. Congenital varicella syndrome, maternal VZV infection during the first 20 weeks of pregnancy. And that leads to, uh, chiotrichal skin lesions, which is cutaneous scarring, um, limb hypoplasia. Growth retardation, eye defects, which include cataracts, chorioretinitis, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you diagnose this? You diagnose it with a Tanzac smear, which is no longer used but still commonly tested on exams uh, of a sample taken from open vesicle, which may demonstrate multinucleated giant cell intra-inclusion bodies. Intra-inclusion bodies in patients with HSV-1, HSV-2, and VZV. Now, the treatment of vaccination, the treatment for shingles is acyclovir and famcyclovir. You can also give a live attenuated virus, which is controversial to give to children. Um, typically, it's given as a booster for elderly to prevent reactivation. Now, there's one thing here. You never, ever give a salicyte, which like aspirin, to children suspected of having viral infections, a specifically VZV, uh, chicken, which is chickenpox or influenza virus, as this can cause the rare but rapidly fatal what? You got it. Rye syndrome. Rye syndrome. Now, this acute encephalopathy progression relates to cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressures. So you're going to see lethargy. You're going to see sleepy but responsive vomiting. You're going to see stupors, uh, seizures, uh, intact but sluggish pupillary light reflexes, decorticate rigidity, comatose, 
loss of deep tendon reflexes, fixed dilated pupils, cerebral, uh, decerebral rigidity, or even flaccidity. You want to see all these, and even death. Okay, so you never want to give these to rise syndromes. Now, the labs would look like an increased serum, just to write this in here, an increased serum NH3, AST, ALT, damage in the liver, LDH, and prothrombin time. All those would be increased. You would see a decreased serum glucose, and you would see normal CSF, and increased intracranial pressure. That's what you see in Rye syndrome. So you do at autopsy, you do a biopsy of the liver, kidney, and brain, and it demonstrates microvesicular steatosis. Not macro, but microvesicular steatosis. So that is Rye syndrome tied in to uh, VZV for you. That's a good little connection to make that you never want to give a kid aspirin that's, that's taking this stuff. All right. So a herpes virus. This is an icosahedral capsid that is enveloped linear double-stranded DNA viruses. It's very large. It's usually the second in size only to the pox virus. Only second in size to the pox virus. So it's an envelope derived but budding from nuclear membrane, not cytoplasmic membrane, because assembly occurs in the nucleus. So HSV1, HSV2, and VZV all have multinucleated giant cells with intranuclear inclusion bodies on the Tanzig smear uh, of swab of vesicular skin lesions. Now, note that multinucleated giant cells are also seen in retroviruses, paramyxoviruses, which is R RSV, parainfluenza virus, mumps, measles, um, etc., due to the F or the fusion protein on the surface of all members of the paramyxo uh, family. So, in a latent infection, you see in HSV1 a late trigeminal nerve ganglion. ganglion. HSV2, you see a latent in the sacral nerve ganglia. In VZV, you see latent in any, any sensory ganglia. So VZV don't care. He goes all over the place. EBV, you see it latent in B cells. And CMV, you see latent in leukocytes. And that is herpes viridae for you for what you need to know. HPV. This is an icosahedral capsid, non-enveloped, circular double-stranded DNA, and papar papyrovirus. Morphologic hallmark of this guy is coleocytic atypia. Remember that right there, coleocytic atypia. I wish I had a picture to show you. That's squamous epithelial cells with characteristic cytoplasmic vacuoles. So remember, papillomaviruses are transmitted through direct and or indirect contact, like skin contact, sexual contact. They infect non-proliferating squamous epithelium, which gives them the coleocytic atypia, which is nuclear atypia, cytoplasmic, perinuclear halos, etc. Um, the HP1 through the HP4 causes varica vulgaris. That's HP1, HPV1 through HPV4. causes varica vulgalis, which is common skin in plantar warts. Now, HPV6 and 11, 6 and 11, cause condyloma acuminata, which is genital warts, and laryngeal papillomas in children. So, in HSV 16 and 18, 16 and 18 is associated with intra- epithelial neoplasms and angiogenital carcinoma of the uterine, cervix, penis, and anus. HPV 16 and 18 are thought to account for 70% of cervical cancers. So those are the two you want to remember right there, 16 and 18. Note that HPV 16 and 18 are also responsible for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. Okay. 
Now, the virally encoded proteins E6 and E7 contribute to the oncogenic potential of HPV. That's E6 and E7. E6 and E7. E6 binds and promotes proteolysis by the P53. By the P53, P53 tumor suppressor gene uh, to stimulate mitosis. Um, also, it upregulates telomerase to prevent replicative uh, census. Now, EB, E7 binds and promotes proteolysis to the RB gene. To the RB gene, tumor suppressor gene to stimulate mitosis. So, Gardasil is what we use. Um, the HPV vaccine that contains proteins, capsids 6, 11, 16, and 18. So those are what it protects you from. It protects you from condyloma acuminata, which is genital warts and laryngeal papillomas in children, intraepithelial neoplasia, and anogenital carcinoma. Um, so you definitely, if you're a young lady, want to get guard to seal, I highly recommend that. Um, so influenza orthomyxoviruses. What do you know about these guys? So the influenza virus or the orthomyxovirus, the morphology is it has a helical capsid, enveloped, linear, negative sense, single-stranded, eight-segmented RNA virus. It's an orthomyomyxovirus. Myoxo uh, because it interacts with mucins. So his envelope is covered by hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Hemagglutin, hemagglutinin, Neuraminidase. They and it replicates in the nucleus. Orthomyoxoviridae and retroviridae are the only families of RNA viruses that replicate in the nucleus. So what were they again? Retro retroviruses and orthomyxoviruses. Now their virulence factors include hemagglutinin, which binds to salic acid and on cell surface receptors on the RBCs causing hemagglutination. That's why they call it hemagglutinin and the respiratory tract, which initiates cellular infection and absorption. So hemagglutinin or HA is thus antigenic and antibodies directed at the cell surface glycoprotein can prevent infection, which allows for detection of influenza by the hemoabsorption test. Now neuraminidase A or yeah, neuraminidase cleaves neuramic acid in mucin to expose binding sites on cells. Neuraminidase also cleaves the salic acid receptor HA complex. That is important. Neuraminidase also cleaves the salic acid receptor HA complex during budding to release progeny and move on to the next cell. Now, there are two major antigenic changes within each type of influenza A, B, or C, shifts and drifts. Shifts and drifts occur in the HA or NA glycoproteins when you have antigens on the viral cell surface. So this gives the virus their names, like example, H5N1, okay? So you have shift and drift. Shift is the major changes resulting in a complete change of HA or NA. Due to segments of the genome RNA reassorted spaces between, you get like example, a bird to a pig, you get pandemics. Those occur when two strains meet in one host. And those can occur in influenza A. Now drift, you see a minor random gene mutation, which results in epidemics like the seasonal flu. That's drift, not shift. So influenza A has strains in many species, like the chicken, the swine, etc. Both shifts and drifts can occur. Influenza B is only in humans. So only what can occur and what can not occur? If influenza B, if influenza A has strains in many species, both shifts and drifts can occur. Uh, who is influenza B found only in humans? So only drift can occur. Shift could not be able to occur, right? Very good. Now the vaccine is a killed virus and attenuated intranasal vaccine, which is reformulated each year because of the shifts and the drips. So to treat this guy, you treat it with Xanamir or also Tamivir, which is a neuraminidase inhibitor, 
uh, amantadine or rimantadine, which is an M2 channel blocker, which inhibits viral uncoding. So you have very high rates of resistance in influenza. Now the signs and symptoms is basically the flu. You get the fever, the chills, the myalgias, the malaise, the headaches, um, etc. Now for increased uh, risk individuals like the elderly or the immunocompromised, you can see pneumonia due to secondary bacterial infection, most commonly caused by who? Well, bacteria. Staph aureus, you got it. So that's influenza for you. So let's talk about the measles and the mumps. This is a helical capsid, enveloped, linear, single segmented, nonsense, single stranded RNA paramyxovirus. All paramyxoviruses infect the respiratory epithelium. All paramyxoviruses infect the respiratory epithelium. Now, measles and mumps are known to cause viremia and spread to other tissues. So let's talk about rubeola or the measles. This is a 10 to 14 day incubation period followed by a prodrome. So the fever and the four C's um, of the measles are conjunctivitis, which is going to give you photophobia, cough, coryza, and complex spots. I know that should be a C, but it's a K. Complex spots, which is important. So it affects respiratory epithelial cells, replicates and lyses them, spreads to the mucosa, causing complex spots. One to two days later, spreads to the dermis, causing a maculopapular rash starting at the head, okay, and works its way down. So it enters the CNS, so you get a possible encephalitis. Many years later, you have a potential for SSPE, which is subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis due to the measles. Um, so the complex spots, that's pathognomonic bright red lesions with a white central dot. It occurs on buccal mucosa. Now the complications of it is one in 1,000 is encephalitis, pneumonia, and SSPE. Measles is one of the top five causes of the red pediatric rashes. So other possible common causes would be, name a couple, roseola, rubella, paro, parvovirus B19, and scarlet fever. Very good. Now, progressive SSPE with progressive encephalitis that is rare and late manifestation of measles. It involves both gray and white matter causing slow CNS degeneration. So what about the mumps? This is a respiratory transmission and infection, which leads to a viremia, which leads to a hematogenous spread, and an infection of the parotids are the most common with the mumps. Infections of the parotids are the most common. And the testes generally causing a unilateral orchitis. That can also be the mumps, a unilateral orchitis. Unilateral orchitis. As an 18 to 21 day incubation, then a prodrome. So you see a fever, a headache, malaise, then painful parotid swelling, which can be unilateral or bilateral. It typically begin and resolve spontaneously within one week. So the most common the most common complication in children of the mumps is meningoencephalitis. Meningoencephalitis is the most common complication in children. It can also cause orchitis, which is rare bilaterally involvement and can lead to sterility. Mumps is one of the three most common causes of aseptic meningitis. You know what the other two viruses are that we talked about? Echinovirus and Coxsackie virus. So in aseptic meningitis, which is meningitis without a dem uh, demonstrable organism, CSF will show increased lymphocytes, but not glucose. 
and normal to slightly increased protein. The negative gram stain and culture. So note the in bacterial meningitis, CSF will show an increased white blood cell predominantly neutrophils, decreased glucose, and protein is slightly higher and a positive gram culture. So to remember the conditions that cause mumps, it is POM or MOP. Meningitis, which is asymptomatic. Let's write this in here. Meningitis, which is aseptic. Orchitis. And peritidis. So, the only one antigenic type, thus infection or vaccine, MMR, provides immunity for life, unlike the orthomyxoviridae influenza one. Um, the measles, mumps, and rubella are prevented with a live attenuated vaccine known as the MMR, the MMR given during childhood. So that is the measles and the mumps for you, which is the paramyxoviruses. So now let's talk about the parainfluenza and respiratory syncytial viruses. So the parainfluenza and the respiratory syncytial virus I have a helical capsid, they're enveloped, they're linear with a negative sense single-stranded RNA paramyxovirus. So other paramyxoviruses include the measles, the mumps, the, HN, the HNMV, which is the human meadow uh, pneumonia virus. Um, all paramyxoviruses have a viral fusion protein. So all paramyxoviruses have a viral fusion surface proteins, which causes fusion of cells and leads to multinuclear giant cells, which is syncytia formation, hence the name respiratory syncytial virus. It's because of the lead of these fusions to the multinucleated giant cells, which are called a syncytia. That's why we call it respiratory syncytial virus. Now, um, HSV... HMNV and parainfluenza virus are the first, second, and third most common causes of pneumonia in children, respectively. So, respiratory syncytial virus, you think children, right away. Um, so, parainfluenza, its transmission is through respiratory droplets, especially in winter. Especially in winter. Paramyxovirus is the most common cause of croup and children. Croup in children, um, aka laryngeotracheobronchitis. Now croup presents clinically with a harsh steel seal, with a harsh seal-like bark and inspiratory strider. Symptoms result due to inflammation of the larynx and subglottic airway. So you do classical radiographic findings in a subglottic narrowing called the steeple sign with croup. Again, just going any way they could test you here. So adults tend to get a severe cold uh, upper respiratory tract infection instead of croup. Um, HA binds to salic acid on receptor sub cells, so you get endocytosis. And neuraminidase cleaves the HA salic acid receptor interaction and you get a viral spread. Now respiratory syncytial virus you get respiratory droplet transmission. Um, the major cause of infant bronchiolitis Infant bronchiolitis and pneumonia is RSV. Its viral surface fusion proteins cause infected cells to fuse into syncytia, which are multinucleated giant cells. Thus, RSV 
Lower respiratory tract infection consists of supportive measures like fluids and respiratory support, sometimes with addition of aerosol beta agonists like albuterol in symptomatic patients, which are wheezing. Now, plaxuzumab blocks the fusion protein F, so it can be used for prophylaxis in immunocompromised patients at risk for RSV infections. Now, ribavirin, which is a purine nucleoside analog, may be used in severe cases of RSV in immunocompromised patients. However, in light research of RCTs and uh, systemic reviews, more liberal use of ribavirin is controversial at best. In 2009, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended against the use of ribavirin. Now, only paramyxoviruses that does not use high, uh, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase attaches to epithelium using protein G. Protein G. So the parainfluenza has both HA and NA, mumps has both HA and NAA, and measles has hemagglutinin but no neuraminidase. So the measles is the only one that doesn't have neuraminidase of the parainfluenza viruses. And that is the parainfluenza and respiratory syncytial viruses. So moving on to parvovirus B19. He's a fun one. So parvovirus B19 is a non-cosahedral capsid, non-enveloped, and a linear single-stranded DNA. He is the only, only single-stranded DNA virus. He is the only single-stranded DNA virus, and he is the smallest DNA virus. He infects through respiratory uh, trans transmission. Uh, it can be vertical, mother to fetus. It can be transfusions or transplacental. He infects lice. He infects lyses and destroys erythroblasts. So this causes fifth disease or erythema infectiosum or slap cheeks disease where you get a low-grade fever, a low-grade fever for 7 to 10 days, low-grade fever for 7 to 10 days, which ends up being a classic erythematous macular rash that starts on the face, that's why they call it slap cheeks, and appears after resolution of the fever. Two, day, two to three days after the slap cheeks have um, appeared, the rash may spread to the trunk extremities where it takes on a lacy reticular pattern. Now, adults, you get joint pain and polyarthralgias, which are immune complexes, and or edema. Rash is less common in adults. So, speaking of rashes, what are the top five pediatric red rashes? Erythema infectiosum or parvovirus B19 is one of them. Measles, rubella, scarlet fever, and roseola. Very good. Now, parvovirus B19 can also do something called an aplastic anemia in kids with chronic anemia. Like example, sickle cell kids can cause aplastic anemia in these kids because it preferentially infests what? Erythroblasts. So in a second or third or first or second trimester infections, you could have high drops fetalis, um, which is severe fetal anemia, which leads to fetal congestive heart failure, which leads to massive edema or death. So parvovirus B19 is no joke when it comes to aplastic anemia. So the pox viruses. So the pox viruses are enveloped DNA viruses. They are large, linear, double-stranded DNA with a complex capsid symmetry. It's the only DNA virus that replicates entirely in the cytoplasm. Replicates entirely in the cytoplasm instead of the nucleus. But you get intracytoplasmic inclusions known as guarnary bodies.
Again, those are intracytoplasmic inclusions, which are Guarnieri bodies, which are diagnostic of the pox viruses. Note that a patinovirus or hepatitis B replicates partly in the cytoplasm and partly in the nucleus. So the only DNA virus without isocodrahedral symmetry instead of the pox virus is a box or brick shape. It makes its own envelope, which is not a modified version of the host cytoplasm or nuclear membrane. It has its own viron-associated transcriptase. So that is the pox viruses for you. So let's talk about smallpox or variola virus. It's eradicated with a live attenuated vaccine virus. In addition to protecting against smallpox vaccine, will also protect against cowpox, monkeypox, and vaccinia. Now, the vaccinia virus or the cowpox leads to blisters on the milk, milkmaid's hands. Blisters and milkmaid's hands. That's usually with the cowpox. So small and chickenpox. Smallpox are lesions of the same age, prominent on the face and palms, and you usually get deeper lesions. Chickenpox, on the other hand, is caused by the herpes viridae varicella zoster virus, and the lesions are different at ages, more prominent on the trunk and more superficial lesions. Now, muscatellum musculum contagiosum is transmitted by close personal contact. It causes small, white, pink, wart benign tumors of skin mucous membranes, not warts. This is important for your exam. Not warts, which are normal warts caused by papillomavirus. These papules are described as having a central depression. central depression, and often umbil umbilicated. It's seen frequently in AIDS patients, often near anogenital regions and trunks. So let's talk about prions. Prions. Prions are abnormal pathogenic glycoproteins, each encoded by a single normal cellular genome. In prions, the secondary structure is beta-pleated sheets versus the normal non-pathogenic proteins, which have an alpha helical secondary structure. Prions recruit and induce normal proteins to change to an abnormal beta-pleated sheet configuration. And an abnormal beta-pleated sheet forms aggregates into amyloid-like filaments disrupting neurons and causing symptomatic disease. Prion-related diseases include spongiform encephalopathy. Spongiform encephalopathy which give the brain a vacuolated appearance. For example, uh, Crutzfeld-Jacobs disease. Crutzfeld-Jacobs disease. Kuru. Scrapey. And now about the famous mad cow disease. So that can cause the spongy form encephalopathies of the prion-related diseases. So let's talk about prions versus viruses. Prions do not contain any DNA or RNA, unlike viruses, which do. Prions are highly resistant to heat and UV light, unlike viruses, which are readily inactivated with heat and UV light. Their proteins denature and they, the UV light disrupts their DNA that they carry. Now, the prions are products of cellular normal are products of normal cellular genes, which may explain why prions do not elicit an antibody or inflammatory response. Let me repeat that. Prions are probably products of normal cellular genes, which explains why prions do not elicit an antibody or inflammatory response, unlike viruses, which can elicit such responses that it's uh, it's unbearable for the person. 
So prions are very much more interesting than they are given credit for. So let's talk about the rabies virus. Now, the rabies is a bullet-shaped, bullet-shaped capsahedral, helical capsid symmetry, which is enveloped, linear, linear, non-stranded sense, single-stranded RNA, rabidovirus. Classical rabies virus is one of 10 different viruses with the rabies serotype of the Lacera gene. Now, how does it get transmitted? It's transmitted in the U.S. through rabid bats. That's how rabies gets transmitted in the U.S. is through rabid bats. And in the West, it gets transmitted through skunks. Now, raccoons and foxes in the East... in the East United States, should say. Now, I know another disease caused by bats and birds that can be problematic for cave explorers is the fungus, you tell me. We've talked about it. Histoplasma capsulatum. There you go. Now, developing countries, rabid dogs account for 90% of the source in developing countries. Note, the U.S. is considered canine rabies-free due to widespread immunization of dogs. Now, the rabies virus has a glycoprotein that binds nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. It binds nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the postsynaptic muscle membrane at the neuromuscular junction. So that's going to lead to initial infection, replication within the striated muscle cells, which leads to virons that bind NCAM, which is neural cell adhesion molecule, and interneurons, which shelters the rabies virus from the host immune system. At this point, the rabies vaccination is ineffective. So the retrograde axonal transport towards the CNS causes replication and transcription of the rabies virus that occurs in eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion bodies called Negri bodies, which you can see right here. Negri bodies, which are neuronal cell bodies in the spinal cord and CNS, especially Purkinje cells in the cerebellum and the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus. Rabies virus may then spread to the brain, which rapidly causes fatal encephalitis. It may travel down the peripheral nerve axons, where large amounts of virus can be shed into the salivary and saliva glands and the secretions of other organs like the intestines. The infection may become spread via bites or contact with bats and aerosols or caves, um, etc. Now, there's a prodromal signs and symptoms that are soon followed by a rapidly progressive encephalitis with high fevers and neuronal death and demyelination. Signs and symptoms of fulminant rabies are devastating. So the treatment is to first, actually before that you see mental status changes like confusion, lethargy, psychosis with hallucinations and hyperactivity is very common. Uh, neurological damage and dysfunction, you see aphasia, lack of coordination, painful spasms of the throat muscles precipitated by swallowing, so you see hydrophobia, they hate water, there's an intense fear and uh, of, of aversion to swallowing fluids, which may contribute to the hypersalivation and classic rabid appearance by foaming at the mouth. Um, within days of onset, neurological symptoms include seizures, paralysis, coma, death, you're not going to survive this. Um, the treatment is to first wash the wound, wash the wound. The rabies vaccine is one of the fewest vaccines given after exposure to the virus. It works by taking advantage of long incubated periods of rabies by increasing host cell immunity. So that's passive immunity, and it's the human rabies immunoglobulin, uh, which is abbreviated HRIG.
H-R-I-G, human rabies immunoglobulin. All right, and that's the rabies virus for you. So let's talk about the Rio virus. So the Rio virus is an icosahedral capsule, non-enveloped, double-stranded DNA with 10 to 12 segments. It's respiratory enteric orphan Rio viruses. So it's a only, the only double-stranded RNA virus. The only double-stranded RNA virus is the Rio virus. It's one of three non-enveloped RNA viruses, which is the Picorna, the Calcia, and the Rio. So you, if you withstand harsher conditions, typically enteric and fecal oral transmission, you won't get this. Now, rotavirus is the most common cause of viral gastroenteritis in infants and young children. Now, it's both fatal and non-fatal. Okay, so the rotavirus is no joke. Now, um, you get this through fecal oral transmission, so it's common in preschools. Preschools, daycare centers. All right. So a viral encoded non-structural protein, NSPA, or NSP4, NSP4 encodes an enterotoxin, which leads to a non-bloody non-bloody, non-inflammatory, watery diarrhea. Which leads to dehydration, which leads to death without rehydration. So the rotavirus vaccines are live oral vaccines that contain multiple serotypes. So that is your rheoviruses for you. So let's talk about the rhinovirus, the funnel rhino. So the rhinovirus is an icosahedral capsule, non-enveloped, linear, positive sense, single-stranded RNA picornovirus. He is definitely the cause of the common cold. Definitely picking rhinovirus for the cause, cause of the common cold. He's acid labile, thus is why the GI tract is unaffected versus an enterovirus. So temperature for optimum growth is 33 degrees versus the enterovirus is 37 degrees Celsius. Thus, it prefers to replicate in the upper airway in the nose. So it attaches to host cells through ICAM-1, which is intracellular adhesion molecule 1. So it's a cause of the common cold. The second cause would be what? coronavirus. The second cause is the coronavirus. It has a two to four day incubation period. Other causes of common cold include adenovirus, coronavirus, influenza C virus, and Coxsackie virus. There is no vaccine available. There's a greater than a hundred strains or serotypes based on the variant surface proteins. So there's two modes of transmission. It's either direct person-to-person -person respiratory spread, or it's an indirect mode where respiratory droplets are deposited on hands or surface fomites. I'd like to test you on this. Surface fomites and are then transported by fingers to the nose or eyes. This is the primary route of transmission is through fomites of the rhinovirus to get in the nose and attached through ICAM-1. And there's no vaccine because there's greater than 100 serotypes. That's right. And that pretty much covers him. So hang in there. We're almost there. We got the rubella virus or the ruba virus. This is the last one. So we're going to have a little fun with him. All right. He's an icosahedral capsid. 
enveloped linear positive sense single stranded RNA toga virus. His transmission is through respiratory droplets or transplacental. He's 14 to 21 day incubation followed by a prodrome, which is malaise, low grade fever, then the macular papular rash. Rubiola is also known as the German measles. The German measles or the three day measles. Now the rash starts on the face down to the extremities, the same as the measles, but the rash lasts for three days. So pregnant women infected during the first trimester can get congenital rubella. The classic triad of congenital rubella includes number one, the PDA, number two, cataracts, Number three, sensor neural deafness. Now the heart defects with the PDA or the patent ductus arteriosum, they can also have a pulmonary artery stenosis or hyperplasia. Now the eye defects is the cataracts, which is the white pupils, and it can also have microthalmia, uh, gluconoma, pigmented retinopathy. The sensory neural deafness is the CNS defects and you can also have mental retardation with the rubavirus. Now the skin and muscle defects is the perperic blueberry muffin rash. Perperic blueberry muffin rash. blueberry muffin rash, which they call dermal erythropoiesis, may also be seen in congenital, what was it? CMV. You see radiolucent, so if you see blueberry muffin rash right away, you think rubavirus or rub, rub, rubiola, rubella, uh, or CMV, it's one of the two. If it's CMV, it's usually congenital. Um, so there you go. Now it also shows radiolucent bone lesions. Radiolucent bone lesions versus the metaphyseal dystrophy and periosteitis characteristic of congenital syphilis. So, th so some other defects include microcephaly. Microcephaly versus the macrocephaly characteristic of congenital toxoplasmosis with the re-enhancing lesions causing the mass effect causing the seizures, right? And then you get some other defects besides the microcephaly. Some uh, not minor ones are hepatosplenomegaly and thrombocytopenia. Now, pregnant women infected during the first trimester, um, the maternal signs and symptoms may include a macular papular rash and a classic finding of posterior auricular and suboccipital lymphadenopathy. And also arthritis. So that is the classic finding of post-auricular and suboccipital lymphadenopathy with a pregnant woman infected during the first trimester. And also we give a live attenuated virus, um, which is the MMR. And that covers up viruses for you. And that, there's a ton more information, but I'm just if you concentrate on just what I went over, you'll get a lot of points just from that. So, good job.